As we were worshiping, have you thought about what happens when we launch those words and prayers from our heart? Where do they go? What happens? Is, is there any response up there when we offer all that? Have you thought about the fact that God seeks two things? He seeks to seek out and save the lost, and then he seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. What does he do with all this worship he's seeking? Let's open our Bibles to Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to read some verses from both. And I want you to consider with me where our worship does go. I mean, as it rises from our hearts, as it blends in the oneness that we share in Christ, and as it ascends before God, where does it go? What does he do with it? Why does he want it? While we're here seated and standing with songs of heaven on our lips, God's word tells us that something is happening in the place we have pointed our hearts toward. What we do, what we say, what we think, what we pray, and what we give. Not merely at the end of our lives, but right now, rises to the Lord. And he does something with it. He receives it. And all of the Bible is built around the reality that right now, continuously, before the presence of God at his throne, there is collection of... And then the offering of the worships of each individual saint poured out before him. We're going to read about that. And do you realize how much what we do today as we gather to worship and what we offer every day of our lives, how much that matters to the Lord. So right now, as we sing, as we give, as we worship, right now what happens is the scene that we see in Revelation 4 and 5. In a few moments, as we look at these words, I trust God will tune our hearts to be in touch with what He is doing right now and how we can be in step and in tune in our offerings to Him of these these acts of worship that He saved us to offer. As we look in Revelation 4 and 5, we see God pulling back the veil. We look through the Apostle John's eyes in this book of Revelation. We see heaven as John seems to be transported on an angel's wings to look down and to see from each perspective and vantage point the throbbing hum of worship at the very center of the universe, the throne of God. John gets a guided tour of heaven, and his inspired words portray for us a scene of angels, hundreds of millions of them, as the Bible puts it, 10,000 times 10,000 in our text. They're massed or clustered all about that smooth crystal sea. And that sea is reflecting back toward God all the awesome sights, images, colors from its mirror-like surface. As we look into these few verses we're going to read in a moment, our senses are almost besieged. There's so many different sensations. There are sounds, there are sights, there are colors that that just almost overload our, our capacity to process the colors, the materials surrounding God's throne, as John records, are almost beyond description. As we enter into chapter 4, we see a, an emerald green rainbow. I've never seen one of those. I can't wait till I can. The only thing is, it's going to be the first complete rainbow we get to see. Because of the pure as glass crystal of the golden pavement, that emerald green rainbow continues to its full orb. And the throne of God is surrounded in that iridescent beauty. Then the city that that stretches beyond has thick walls, John says, but they're made of jasper. To us, jasper, what's that? That's the ancient Roman word for diamonds. Now imagine with me a diamond ring and think of the, the color and, and you know you can grab your wife's ring and hold it up or yours and look into the light and you see the, the refraction and all the colors. But imagine diamonds big enough to make walls out of and then think of walls that extend 1,500 miles high. You can think of the incredible dazzling flashes of light multiplied by those diamonds. But then when you look down, you see the gold that is transparent to the overpowering radiance of God's glory, refracted and glistening through the entire city, and everything is made of gems of such colors 
that we can't even begin to understand as they send forth the light of God's glory. Here are the colors of heaven in the order that they appear in our text. In these words, you know, carnelian and jasper, they don't mean anything to us. Let me just tell you the colors, because these are the colors that God has chosen to surround himself with. His glory is reflected in all these hues. There are sky blue stones with translucent colored stripes. Parallel layers, these stones that are named, have red and white, orange, red, and brownish red, and even blood red colors then there's a transparent one of yellowish gold and then a light blue one and a yellowish green and an apple green and a gold tinted green god loves the greens and then there's deep blue and then a shining violet and then finally an intense purple color and all those colors mentioned in those stones surrounding god all are reflecting his glory but the sight It's so hard for us to take in. There's so much beauty, so much color in our text, and so much brilliance that overwhelms our eyes. John seems to look at it one piece at a time. And starting in chapter 4, he he sees the angels, and those capture his attention. And those countless white-robed angels are standing like living walls of pure white linen robes. They rise in circular rings, seemingly reflecting the light of God. But they're not standing still. They seem to be rising and falling to the sounds of those four creatures that are crisscrossing the expanse on the four corners of God's throne. They move as one. All those angels, hundreds of millions of them, falling down together on their faces as they speak of the wonders of God's glory. I was thinking this morning, hundreds of millions of them in unison all at the same exact instant, falling down, all of them saying the same words, I have trouble getting eight children in the car at once. Can you imagine hundreds of millions in absolute unison together? Then John's gaze goes toward the floor, if it can be called that. It's an ocean of completely clear and reflective glass. He calls it a crystal sea. This crystal sea reflects and and amplifies the colors, the lights, and the objects. All are reflected back intensifying what's going on in front of God. And then there's that throne. Central to heaven is the throne of God. 36 to 39 times mentioned in the book of Revelation, it's completely encircled by that emerald green rainbow that is over and around and beneath the throne, but we're overwhelmed as we, by John's inspiration, look and see Not only are there colors, there's sound coming out of this throne. He says that there's a massive rumble of powerful sounds as endless peals of thunder with lightning flashing outward from the throne seem to radiate from within the throne of God. But it's not just thunder we hear. John listens carefully and hears loud voices with a sound as loud as roaring waterfalls rolling past. But in front of the throne, he sees there are seven geysers or towers, burning flames coming up, seven of them surrounding this throne with the lightning radiating out and the fire going straight up. And then, burning in a circle around God's throne are other creatures he introduces us to. They're called the burning ones or the living creatures. We know them as seraphs, uh, plural seraphim, which literally in Hebrew means the burning ones. They capture our focus. Our eyes follow those four glistening living beings. They seem to be the worship directors of heaven, each of them having four distinct faces, a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle, each of them completely inside and out covered with eyes. Ezekiel tells us they move like flashes of light, and when they move, fire passes between them. We've never seen anything like this. It's overwhelming to us. And listening carefully, John says that their wings, as they flash around, have a deafening roar as they glide around the expanse surrounding the Ancient of Days in a theocentric orbit, each one of them always having their face facing him as they move never taking their faces off from the Ancient of Days. And then, John points out that beyond that throne with its rainbow, with the lightning coming out, beyond those seven torches burning and those four living creatures that are crisscrossing and blazing with light, he said there's another ring around that throne, and there are 24 elders. 24 thrones with 24 celestial men, 24 white-robed celestial humans that are sitting on those thrones. Each one has a harp. Each one wears a crown. But where we come in this morning, the scriptures say each one is holding 
a golden bowl. And that bowl contains the collected worship of the saints of God. What you and I are to be offering right now, the reason we were saved. And those elders collect our worship. And then as the worship leaders, these four seraphim, give the signal, everyone falls on their faces before God. And when those elders fall right in front of his throne, from 24 thrones, those men tip their bowls and pour their worship out. I wonder this morning, as that scene is continuously replayed, and as that worship call comes, and as those 24 elders fall, and as their bowls are tipped out, was there anything from you in that bowl this morning? Are you offering the offerings of worship that God collects? Are you offering the sacrifices of devotion and praise and giving to Him that those representatives of us, the redeemed, can pour out? That's the question that this scene begs from each one of us. Are you giving what is being poured out in eternity this morning? Well, let's read just a few verses. Revelation 4 and 5. And with what I have shared with you, Let us listen and watch through John's eyes. And I'm going to start with verse 3. And it says, And he who sat there on the throne, this is the Ancient of Days, was like Jasper, that's the old word for diamond, and Sardis stone, one of those beautiful colored stones in appearance. And there was a rainbow about the throne with the appearance like an emerald. And around the throne, here are those 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes. They had crowns of gold on their head. In verse 5, and from the throne proceeded lightnings radiating outwards, thunderings, and there are those voices. And seven lamps of fire like geysers were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before that throne, there's that sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne and around the throne, the four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had the face of a man, the fourth Like an eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around and within, do not rest day or night. This is a constant, ongoing worship service, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and lives forever, Verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And then slip on down to verse 6. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne stood the Lamb and it describes Christ. And then down to verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, those worship leaders, and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb. Listen to this. Each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers, the offerings of us as priests, our worship to God collected, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And that song is recorded in verses 9 and 10. Verse 10 says, You have made us kings and priests to our God. And that's offers of praise. And I looked in verse 11, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. Now the hundreds of millions get involved. The living creatures, the four worship leaders, the elders representing us, and a number of them was hundreds of millions saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them I heard, saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Wow. That's what's going on. Now, at that moment, that involves the unfurling of judgment on this earth. But prior to that, it involves our offered worship of our lives. I hope you're sending something up. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, challenge our hearts. Open our eyes. Open our lips. Open our wills. I pray that our devotion, our bodies, our words 
our good deeds for others, the stewardship of our resources and money and finances and treasures, that we would be sending much upward to you this day and every day until we get to join that scene in heaven. Thank you that that's what you created us to do, and it starts right now. Challenge and draw and move us to be giving into eternity what you wish to receive from us this moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please open to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. And for the next uh, 20 or so minutes, we're going to look at what exactly is it that the Lord wants. I mean, if this is a scene, if he's got these collectors up there collecting something, what does he want to collect? What does he want from us? And Mark 12 and verse 33 begins telling us what we're to do. God said in the Old Testament he had a selective family of the Levitical family who were priests, and they represented the nation. But in the New Covenant, we are given the privilege of all of us being priests, all of us coming before God, all of us being able to give gifts and sacrifices and worship to God. As we saw last week, we, when we were saved, became a kingdom of priests. We became a holy nation like Israel was. We are today the offerers to God of acceptable worship. What is it he's looking for? Well, listen to Christ's words in Mark 12 and verse 33. And if you're a Bible marker, I'm going to give you seven different types of offerings of worship that God is looking for. Here's the first one. In, in Mark 12, 33, he calls our devotion a burnt offering. This is what, what is recorded by Mark. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. More than all of the animal sacrifices, the devotion of our heart, listen, of our heart, our understanding, our emotions, our soul, our strength, loving others, this devotion is more than all the burnt offerings. What does God want from us? I wrote in my Bible, He wants our devotion as a priest as a burnt offering. He wants us as His priests to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and for that love to go beyond just us to, to reach out to others, to love our neighbors as ourselves. He said that devotion to Christ is like the, the smoke rising from a burning offering on an altar. God wants to receive from us, his priests, our devotion. I hope you're giving him your devotion. I hope that when you first wake up in the morning, as morning uh, gilds the sky, my heart's awakening cry is, may you be praised. And I offer my devotion, I offer my love. And that immediately rises up to him, fills one of those bowls. And then when those worship leaders direct, it gets poured out. And you and I can be a part of the worship of God. This second, this moment this day. Keep turning to Romans chapter 12. Go to the right in your Bibles. You're in Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans 12. Because Paul talks in this sacrifice uh, priestly way all the way through the scriptures. He uses this, whenever worship is referred to, he he uses the the picture of the Old Testament sacrifices and and that, that very graphic Uh, imagery becomes something for us to hang these thoughts on. This is what he says in chapter 12 of Romans. He says not only a priest's devotion is a burnt offering, but their very life and body becomes a sacrifice. And and he, he calls the Romans to this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, save people, redeemed, regenerated by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And think about all that the Jews went through. They They thoughtfully picked a sacrifice. They picked an unblemished, perfect one that that was their best. And that one they they brought and led by hand and identified and brought that sacrifice into the temple area. You know what the Lord says? I want you to do the same thing. I want you to give me the best and greatest that you have, your body. And I want you alive as a sacrifice. And here's what I want from you. I want you to be holy and acceptable. I want you to give me your true spiritual worship. That's what reasonable service means. It's it's a word from the temple. It speaks of temple worship. I want you giving your body on a regular basis. I want you to be renewing that commitment. I want you to keep bringing yourself to me saying, I am your sacrifice today. What do you want to do with my life? 
I am yours. I belong to you. I am a a sacrifice. You say, what, what is that like? We'll turn over to chapter 15 because Paul talks about this in Romans 15. He says that when he goes out soul winning, when he goes out evangelizing, when he goes out preaching, what he's trying to do is see people coming to Christ, getting saved, and joining this ascent of smoke from the altars of their heart as they offer their life every day back to him. He says that, that is a great sacrifice I want to offer to God. Verse 16 of Romans 15, he says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. He says, I'm running out to these pagans. I'm ministering the gospel of God. I'm going out as his servant dispensing this gospel so that, look at verse 16, the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What he said is, their lives... Energized by the Holy Spirit when they're redeemed, their lives as they give themselves back willingly, as they realize that Christ bought them, they're bought with a price, therefore they belong to God, as they acknowledge that and say, I'm yours. It's like the smoke of a sacrificial offering rising before God. You remember all the way through the scriptures when when Noah offered that sacrifice. In fact, before that, when Abel offered that sacrifice, and then when Noah followed up on it, and all of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's sacrifices, all the myriad of the children of Israel, it says that God smelled that as a sweet-smelling aroma. What he's saying is what they did on earth rose up before his presence in heaven, and he was pleased by it. God says right now, when you and I acknowledge we're bought with a price by Jesus Christ who died in our place and we acknowledge that ownership he has, that when we reaffirm that to him and say, I'm yours, that that makes us like a flaming sacrifice and it rises before God and it pleases him. That's why you should often remind the Lord, I am thine, O Lord. I've heard your voice. It's spoken such love to me. I long to rise in the arms of love and be closer drawn to thee. I want to be yours. I want to more fully yield myself to you as your servant. That pleases him. That's something you can do anytime, no matter what you're doing during the day. Just say, God, as I sit here, as I drive here, as I do my job, as I whatever I do to earn a living, I'm yours. And that sacrifice rises before him. So, number one, our devotion is a burnt offering. Our life is a sacrificial offering. Turn to Philippians 2. It doesn't stop there. Philippians, keep going to the right. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Next book, to the right, chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 17. Because not only our devotion of our heart, our physical bodies, but also our service, our ministry that we do, the, the work, you could put it, for the Lord, is something else we offer. Philippians 2.17, uh, this is what Paul says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service or ministry of your faith, He said there's a lot that entails the service to the saints. And he says, I'm doing that. He says, I am serving. I'm like a ministering servant to the saints. You and I can be too. You know, there's so many things that go on around here. People constantly are working. There are some that come and and set up and move around and prepare. And I see them. I see servants standing at the copy machine making little papers for the Sunday schools. I see others making prayer lists for the Sunday schools. And I see others who are, are preparing the refreshments and others who are making sure that everything's ready. And all those little acts of service are like drink offerings. You know what a drink offering is? It's like taking a glass of water and pouring it on sand. You pour it out, boom, you can't get it back. It's just absorbed and gone. And the Lord says, when you give your strength and your energy and your time and your devotion in working in, in some service for my church, it's like you poured out that part of your life. You can't get it back. But that drink offering rises before me as an act of worship. Think about that when nobody notices what you do. You got extra credit. You didn't lose any of it. When when we do secretly for the Lord our work, it becomes a complete offering. That's why anybody that's in any public ministry, uh, singing or ministering or speaking or anything, they have to be careful because they can lose some of the reward if they accept credit for it, if they take the glory from themselves. It doesn't all rise and ascend. It gets stunted and stilted. But if you do secret acts of devotion or if in humility you offer your service to the Lord, This is what he says in Philippians 2.17. I glad and rejoice with you all because I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice. Do you hear the words of of the altar? He says, I'm pouring out my life on the altar and I can't recover it and I'm giving it to the Lord. So 
as priests this morning, any service ministry we do in the name of Christ, we pour out to him. Paul, at the end of his life, says, I'm already poured out as a drink offering. His whole life he looked at as pouring out to the Lord. Here's another one. If you want to look at Philippians 4.18, it's just on the other side of the page in my Bible. Here's another aspect. Number one, our devotion is a burnt offering in Mark 12. Number two, our life can be continuously a sacrifice, as Romans 12 and 15 said. Our ministry or service is a drink offering, as Philippians 2 says. But number four, our gifts, our money that we give. Remember last week I talked about the actual giving of financial gifts. Look what Paul says about it in Philippians 4.18. I indeed have all and abound. I am full. I have received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. Now, you can read in the book of Acts and you can follow along in Paul's missionary journeys and you find that Paul was supported by this wonderful church in Philippi that was so far away and they were financially ministering to him. So this is a very dollars and cents, money kind of thing, an offering verse. But look what he says. He says, that gift of money was a sweet smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice that pleased God. When those Philippians who had to work very hard, many of them were slaves, they found something that was their possession, and they gave that possession up and put it into the hands of the leaders of the church to send off to Paul. At that instant, 2,000 years ago, that offering rose, as it says in verse 18, as a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice that pleased God. Did you know when you were giving to the Lord in the offering, did you know that every gift that was prayerfully prepared with a heart of devotion and saying, God, I'm giving that into your hands, that as that entered that bag, it's just a puff of smoke. You couldn't see it. But it rose up like a fragrant offering burnt to the Lord. And it ascended up and was poured out before the throne of God. I mean, to think all that for a little check, that is eternally offered to God in worship, that, that rises before him. Unbelievable how Paul looked at life, how he taught those Philippians, and how through the New Testament comes to us. We can be giving our gifts as a fragrant free will offering. Now, I keep going to the right, to the book of Hebrews. You by Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Look at chapter 13. There are more of these. How we as priests on earth can offer our worship to God that he will receive in heaven, our devotion, our life, our service, our gifts. Here's another one. Our mouths can be used. And I hope you're using yours this morning. Look what it says in Hebrews 13. Therefore, by him, verse 15 of Hebrews 13, let us continually... So this was one that, don't wait, do it as much as you can. Offer the sacrifice. Here's that priestly offering uh, scenario or motif he's using. Our sacrifice of praise to God. Now what is that? What are you talking about? That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Every time I read this verse, I have a picture in my mind. I just can't escape it. As a young 30-year-old pastor just started out, uh, first-time senior pastor, left uh, Grace Community and came to this congregation in New England. And I remember one of the first times I preached there, I was very dignified and I could only wear a white shirt. You could only wear white shirts in New England when you preached. All these rules. And I was just careful to be dressed like I was supposed to. And I came to the pulpit. And just then the back door opened and this man walked in. I mean, he looked like Paul Bunyan. And he had a a knife this long hanging from his belt. And he took one of the folding chairs and popped it like that. And it cracked open. He set it down right in the middle of the center aisle looking up at me. Sat down, pulled out the knife. I thought, wow, what are we going to do here? And I'm still preaching and watching all this. And he started cleaning his feet fingernails and watching me he's checking me out he became a dear friend he moved from the back row cleaning his fingernails to the front row the next week he still cleaned them up there with that great big hunting knife I, man he must have a lot of dirt to have a knife that big but i remember the the thing that stuck out about mike my friend he was kind of a professional lumberjack or something huge muscles used to love to carry these 400 pound logs, cherry, solid cherry out of the forest. I mean, he was Mr. He Man. Couldn't sing at all, had no voice, but he'd sit right in front of me. And whenever we had chorus time, he would bellow the words. 
he'd say, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. He couldn't sing at all. People around him were going, because he ruined, the, they, they got off tune with him. But you know what? Look, look back at verse 15, what he's saying. He said, I want to, anytime it's possible, continuously be offering the sacrifice of praise to God. I want my lips to bear fruit, and I want to give thanks to his name. You know what? This verse tells us as priests, we can use our mouths to offer a praise offering. Now leave your knife home, clean your fingernails at home. But bring a clean heart and open your mouth. Are you offering the fruit of your lips to God? Do you realize that you can engage in giving something to God that lasts forever, that will be received by those 24 elders, put into that bowl, and when the worship leaders, those seraphs, say it's time, they pour it out to God. And he says, there's another load from your servants. I mean, every time that load is offered, wouldn't you like something from you to be in there? I do from me. I mean, I sing all the time. For I, I try and use my mouth more for things that will last for eternity than for nothingness. And that's what he's teaching them. Their worship is a praise offering. Look at the next verse. It doesn't stop there. Some of us you know, can't sing all the time, but we have other options. Verse 16 gives us the sixth type of worship we can offer to God as priests. We can offer to him our deeds as spiritual sacrifices. It says, don't forget to do good, verse 16, and to share For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Did you know when we live out the kindness of Christ and the love of Jesus Christ, remember Jesus went about doing good. He did good to people that hated him. He did good people that that didn't receive him. He did good to to people that didn't even acknowledge it. Remember the lepers that, that, that went their way and could care less. Only one was willing to come back and say thank you. But Jesus went around doing good. And you know what it says here? When you and I don't forget how much God has done for us and so we want to do for others, and we do good and we share, those are sacrifices that rise up to God. You know, it's not just the Boy Scouts that should be doing their little good deeds all the time. God's people should be known like they were in the first century. Those Romans had trouble killing the Christians. They did it because they were supposed to, but they had trouble because they were the best citizens. They were the best workers. They were the best neighbors. They were the best friends. They were honest. They were not greedy. They were sharing. They they were just transparently open their lives. I mean, if you wanted something, if you compelled them to go a mile, they went too. If If you asked for their coat, you can have my shirt too. And that's how they were. And boy, we are not that way anymore. We're so protective. We don't share. We keep, we hold, we tug, we want. They gave. And that showed the love of Christ. God so loved that he what? Gave. And so what does he say here? He's looking from us as priests, our deeds, as spiritual sacrifices that we share, that we do good. You know what that means? It means when when someone is stuck somewhere and you're in a hurry, if you stop and if you're good to them and let them go, you've done something good. And right there, rising up to God, if you did it in the power of the Spirit of God, is an offering to the Lord. When someone's in a hurry and you let them get in front of you in line, you know how much you appreciate that. If the lines are all long, someone says, hey, you only have one thing, why don't you come up here? And you go, wow, thanks. There's a kindness in the name of Christ we can offer. And those good deeds... Our spiritual sacrifices. Look at uh, a couple books over. It goes through James, First Peter. Look at chapter two, First Peter two five. Uh, Peter reminds us of how we are God's priests, and it says, "You also, First Peter two five, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Here it is, a holy priesthood. And what are we as believers supposed to be doing? To offer up spiritual sacrifices." What are spiritual sacrifices? The spiritual sacrifices of our deeds, of our worship, of our financial gifts, of our service, of our life, of our devotion. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why he saved us. To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Look at this at the end of verse 5. Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's that all about? Because of the sacrifice of Christ, those offerings we make immediately go into the presence of God. And as he sits there upon the throne, because of the redemption of Jesus Christ and of his salvation to us, when those those kindnesses, those words, those gifts, uh, that devotion, those, those worship-filled uh, offerings of praise to God are collected, they're acceptable to God as they pour it out, even though we're frail 
even though we fail, even though we're sinners, because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us, and because we are accepted and beloved, our offerings go straight through, and God receives them. Here's the last one. Look at Revelation chapter 8. End of the Bible. You know that we're near the end when we get to the end, right? So Revelation 8, look at verses 3 and 4. And, and I was sharing, by the way, this chapter, what day did we read that? Uh, Thursday. You know, we're reading through the Bible as a family, and we were in Revelation 8 on Thursday. And, and I, I emphasized to them, my little congregation of three, five, and seven, and nine-year-olds, and then I emphasized to you who are a little older than that, what it says in chapter 8. And, and, you know, if you just read the Bible real quick, you might miss this. Look what it says in verse 3. Another angel, having a golden censer, kind of the temple, tabernacle, Old Testament motif. By the way, from chapter 4 on in Revelation, it is so Old Testament, it's not funny. If you don't understand Israel and the sacrificial system and the tabernacle and temple, you're just lost. If you don't understand the whole routine of what's going on, you just it just becomes a blur and it's kind of like a comic book. But if you see this, you see it's the tabernacle he's talking about. And this golden censer, and he stood at the altar and was given much incense that he should offer it up with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. What altar is that? Well, you could speculate all you want, but God... God has one golden altar. And it was in the tabernacle, and it was in the temple, and it's very clearly not the brazen altar, it's the golden altar. There were two of those things. One was outside the tent, one was inside the tent. And the one inside the tent was right in front of the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. And that closest object to God, as it were, was the golden altar. And they burned incense on it. Ooh, what was all that about in the Old Testament? Well, look at this. With much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke, verse 4, of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God. You want to know what's right in front of God's nose, as it were? Do you know what's right in front of him? I mean, we got all these flashes and lightnings and, you know, thunder and glass sea and towers of flames and four thing angels, whatever they are, flying around and 24 thrones. You know what's right in front of him? You know, what gets to be right on his lap, as it were? That altar that is of gold with incense on it, which is a picture of the prayers of God's children coming right up to him. You want to get real close to God? Stop. Tune in and talk to him. Pray. It comes right in front of him. And it gets poured on that altar and it rises up into the very face of the God of the universe. I said, kids, on Thursday at lunch, I said, do you see that? Do you see that right now when you pray just goes right before God, just bang, comes right in front of him, and it rises up. What is that for us? Our prayers are an incense offering to God. God collects them. God treasures them. God wants them. God seeks them. God chooses and desires to respond to them. In fact, how God operates in our world is in response to the prayers of his people. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to call upon him to do great and mighty things. And he wants to respond to those prayers and be glorified through you and me as we pray. Well, everything we do, everything we say, everything we pray, everything we give can rise as an offering to the Lord. We're looking at giving finances, but I couldn't miss why we do it. Just one of those seven offerings is the giving of our finances. When you do that, or your secret deeds of service, or those words of praise, or those prayers, or your devotion, whatever, those things come before God. They're collected. Those elders, 24 of them representing the redeemed, when those four angel worship leaders say, it's time. And all the hundreds of millions of angels fall on their faces and the 24 get off their thrones and fall on their faces. At that moment and instant, your worship and mine is poured out before God. Is your life a life of offering worship to God? That's what he wants from us. While I'm praying, I hope that you'll pour out some incense for his altar and pray with me. Father in heaven, we 
are your priest. Everyone here who is born again is your holy priest. And we wish, by the power of your Spirit, through the devotion of our hearts, through the service that we can offer, through the words of praise, through our financial gifts, through the reconsecration of our lives, every one of these facets we've looked at, we want to be offering offerings to you. And we want you to receive those this morning. And we want to live as those who are the circumcision in Christ Jesus who worship God in the Spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would be worshiping you as a lifestyle, offering ourselves to you, and may it be a fragrant aroma before your throne this moment. And Lord, I pray for any who came in, maybe attracted by the life of someone that invited them, maybe because of a deep yearning or or a hopeless feeling, just looking for something. I pray that they would join the worshipers. For you came to seek and to save the lost, so that they might offer acceptable worship to you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May they call out to you this morning, and may they receive that gift for the asking of salvation and join the worshipers.